without further, further ado, I'd love to introduce our speaker, Maya Rogers. Thank you so much, Maya, for your time today. And we are beyond grateful and excited to be opening this event up to both our Scheidler and ACM students, um, the Association for Computing Machinery. So with that, I'd love to introduce Maya. Maya Rogers is the president and CEO of Tetris, overseeing the strategic direction of the iconic video game. Today, Tetris games are available on all major gaming platforms and has become a lifestyle brand with 90 licensing partners in everything from electronics, toys, apparel, lifestyle goods, and even an upcoming biographical film. Maya is also the founding partner of Blue Startups, a venture accelerator in Hawaii. Blue Startups invests in scalable technology companies, and our speaker Maya plays a critical role in its investment strategies and business development. Maya also serves as a board member for various institutions and foundations, such as the Smithsonian APAC Advisory, the Piolani Medical Center for Women and Children, as well as the Women's Fund of Hawaii, just to name a few. Regarding her education, Maya has received her bachelor's in business admin and her executive MBA from Pepperdine University. And with that, please give a warm virtual round of applause for our speaker today, Maya Rogers. Yay, I'm gonna give myself an applause. Hi everyone. Nobody's on camera, but that's okay. We're gonna see you later, right? I hope so. <laughs> All right. All right. So with that, Maya, we do want to begin our fireside chat, which is a Jimmy Fallon S discussion. So thank you again so much for your time. And with that, I'll begin my humble uh, interpretation of Jimmy Fallon. And to start, I would love for you to tell us where you're joining from and kind of how your week has been. My week? Well, I'm joining from my guest room slash office slash sometimes my kids' playroom just uh, right down the street in Kakako. So, you know, I'm sure many students are curious and we have seen your extensive resume and heard it through my lengthy introduction but we would love to hear from you the start of your journey as well as where you were born and raised all right well i was born in japan um i moved to hawaii when i was 11 years old so i would say i grew up in japan and hawaii um and also i went to boarding school in uh on the east coast um so yeah that's kind of my background. And I guess just to give you a little bit of like, why do our family move to Hawaii? Uh, my father was the guy that um, discovered Tetris in the 1980s at a consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. And um, he was in the business then of importing different video games into Japan. And so when we were, I guess we were born in Japan, he started his business there. But one day he said, you know, I want my kids to learn, learn how to speak English. And so it was always a dream of theirs to move us to Hawaii. Um, that's where my parents met and they wanted us to speak English. And so when I moved, it was, I was 11 years old and it was kind of the cutoff of like, before you turn teenager, you can still be pretty bilingual. And so that's how we um, ended up in Hawaii. So before I ask this next question, I would love to just kind of address something that you mentioned earlier. So, you know, you did, you did mention being raised in Japan. And, you know, one would assume that, like many folks in Hawaii, that you did grow up to be bilingual. Mm -hmm. So do you mind sharing a couple of languages that you currently speak or have learned? I only speak a couple. <laughs> only speak a couple. That's still I like a lot. Japanese <laughs> and English, yeah. Japanese Unfortunately, language. I think... Because I became, you know, like English was my second language, I never took on another language. It was kind of like, oh, my dad's like, you don't need another language. You've got two important ones. And so, I don't know. I wish maybe I learned more, but I speak Japanese and English. Fair enough, fair enough. So, um, you know, you did mention, you refer to your father as the guy who made Tetris famous. So what was it like growing up with that kind of father figure and um, influential person within your family? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, like my parents started their business together. My dad, before he discovered Tetris, was a programmer and he programmed the first role playing game and brought it to Japan. And so back in the day, um, I think Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons are popular now, so you guys probably have heard of it but there was nothing like it in Japan. And so um, we used to live in a one bedroom upstairs from my grandparents' house and my dad worked night and day programming this game. And 
Um, you know, the game came out and nobody knew what the RPG game was because that genre didn't exist. And for those of you who don't know like video games well today, RPG is like one of the biggest, especially in Asia for sure, the biggest genre of video game. And so the game came out, Christmas came and like no sales. And my dad was like, holy crap. Like I put everything I have into this game. And he went and um, knocked on doors of all the, the video game publishers, walked them through how to play the game. And then I think it was like the next month, every single magazine had covered it. And that game, which was called the Black Onyx became the number one game the next year and the next year after. And so that's what started his business. And if it wasn't for my mom, the he would have never been able to establish his business because you know he was a, a foreigner living in Japan, didn't speak a word of English. And so my mom had to pretend to do you know, she had to pretend to be the secretary and the bank manager and everything else that my dad wasn't able to do. And so um, I think for me, uh, the biggest takeaway was having sort of a famous father, I guess, turned famous father, um, meant that I spent a lot of time at home um, taking care of my siblings. I have three younger siblings and, you know, spent many nights when my parents weren't really around. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, my, I, I have a youngest, my youngest brother is eight years younger than me. And I remember I, I would come home from school and I would take care of him. And my mom would go to work when I got home. And back in the day, you could do that. Today, probably not so much. But I asked my mom, like, how old was Leo when I used to watch him? And I was eight years old. <laughs> my mom said, oh, maybe a month or two. And so, like, I was that responsible, like, older sister taking care of my family and I'm sure a lot of you can relate, you know, today our both of our parents, most of our parents work. And so we have to play that um, parent slash sibling role. Right, right. So, you know, as Tracy put in the chat, she said that she loves hearing that he knocked on doors and what the kids will call it these days is that he hustled. And, you know, seeing not only your father's uh, work values and work ethics, but also your mother's. How has that come into account within your current position as CEO and the stigmas that you may have faced um, during your time? Yeah, I think I'm a healthy, I would like to say I'm a healthy mix of both of my parents. You know, my mom is like the typical Asian mom, very conservative and wants to make sure that all the steps, the right steps are taken versus my father is kind of the crazy foreigner guy who kind of took chances, right? And like, didn't really think of the consequences. And so I think, I would like to think that I have both of those traits in me. Um, yeah. So, you know, you do mention that, and I think that's really admirable. I really appreciate that you um, still kind of look back to them as role models. And Tetris has been such a, uh, you know, staple foundation in the gaming industry for over 35 years. So I would just love to hear your take. Um, as someone who did used to play Tetris, um, what, what do you think has been the magic of Tetris um, in the way it has not only continued to maintain relevance, but thrived in the past um, 35 years. Yeah, I, I'm, it really comes down to at the bottom of all of it, all of it is that Tetris is inherently a good game, you know, and without that, it would not have had the longevity. Um, and I think what my father did well or all these years before I took over as CEO was to make sure that Tetris was available on every platform. So anytime there's a new console game out or any kind of new platform, we make sure that Tetris is always available because it is one of those games that people know and you know people look for it. And so I think that's kind of kept the games alive. Um, but also like now, you know, we also try to make sure that like, are we, we're always kind of looking at the game scene and, and trying to figure out, does this make sense for the audience? You know, we have different business partners that come up with new ideas and we're always kind of on the lookout of, you know, the recent game that's really popular, that's been popular the last couple of years is called Tetris 99 and it's on the uh, Switch platform, Nintendo Switch platform. And so it's like the whole battle royale kind of gameplay that's popular now and um, so that's just one of the things that like keeps the brand, I guess, fresh and alive. Um, and, you know, most people might not know, right? Like I hear a lot of people like, oh, I haven't played Tetris in so long, but because the game is inherently a good game, it's, it's a great game that I think new generations continue to discover it. And so that helps us, you know, keep the longevity. 
Right, right. And you, you know, did mention a really important point, which was the switch platform. And as you may have may or may not have known, um, during the pandemic, the switch has really skyrocketed in sales. And I love I love to think that um, Tetris wasn't affected by the pandemic, but if it has, um, could you speak to us a little bit on um, how, it, how it's been impacted and how you continue to kind of uh, navigate this post-pandemic world? Yeah, so I um, so the video game industry wasn't really affected during the pandemic. In fact, the industry itself did a lot better because people are at home and they're playing a lot of video games. Um, so I would say like certain games that we have like maybe on the Nintendo Switch, you know, we had a lot of players playing, um, but we did see some decline in revenue because, uh, for example, we have a game, a free game on Tetris.com, which is advertising based, and the advertisers were paying less for the customers. So that happened right overall because businesses were hurting. Um, and then we think maybe some of it too was that a lot of people actually are playing our online game at work. And now that everybody's home and they're working, but not really working, you know, there was a little bit of lack in work, I guess. Um, I said that wrong. But anyway, people were playing less, we think, because they weren't at the office, but they're at home distracted by other things. Um, so in overall, I would say our business wasn't too affected. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of those that are guilty of playing Tetris um, during school and work. Not today, but. Um, Crystal did uh, mention a really important question in the chat, and I would love to um, kind of hear your thoughts behind it as well. So her question was, what does it take to make Tetris available on every platform, as well as the kind of scheduling behind the coding for the new console or platform as well? And I think this question really kind of revolves around the idea of Tetris being a um, existing company and video game. So kind of how you would transfer those legacy platforms as well as the code. So I think the second part, I might have to ask you again, because I had a hard time hearing, but the first part of how, how do we make sure that Tetris is on every platform? So our business is a licensing business, which means that we are not developing all the games, but we are making deals with companies like Nintendo or Sega or Electronic Arts. And those companies would take the license and develop it for a specific console. Um, and so in that sense, you know, we're looking for, the um, what do you call it? The the companies that are right that that are um, that understand that industry well, right? And so so those are the experts that we go after, and we have to of course at the same time know what's going on in the market. So you know maybe uh, Microsoft just announced a new console, and therefore well who should we be talking to? And it's vice versa, right? Companies will approach us too because they want to have Tetris you know, on that platform as an exclusive content or, or something like that. Um, so I, th I think that's really important to, to know what's happening in your industry and to be able to take those opportunities, but also at the same time, uh, making sure that you're finding the right partner, you know, are, they, are these the right guys to take this platform um, and make this game in, in the way that's going to be most successful? And, you know, sometimes you take chances, but it's give and take, I guess. And what was your second part of the question? Something about so code? I, yeah, so I think you actually hit the question right on the dot. Uh, you did mention that the console companies reached out to you as well as you kind of outsourcing the development of it. So with that, you know, you perfectly answered that question. And, you know, in regarding the way that you um, kind of approach um, business matters, what, in your opinion, do you think um, kind of makes you an effective leader um, that, you know, leads the company into the future while still honoring the past? Um, well, I think in terms of business, like relationships is so important, you know, so a lot of the new um, licenses have come out of important relationships that I've had in the industry. So honestly, like always be nice to everyone, you know, people are always going to remember you, somebody like uh, they're always somebody's always going to become like an important person later on, you know, so I'm seeing that now, you know, I've been in the industry for you know, close to 20 years and the people that were like, you know, assistants are now running, you know, companies. And so like keep those relationships active and, and, and it's really important um, to be an effective leader. You know, I think you have to be, you have to have kind of the, the 40,000 foot view or whatever, 10,000 foot view, you know, and not everybody's able to see that. And 
uh, oftentimes only when you're at the top, you finally see like, oh, this is what I need to do to take my company forward. And um, I think it's really important for everyone in the company to, to have a mindset of, okay, well, if it was up to me, how would I take this business? What would be the next step? Instead of always relying on your superiors to figure it out for you, um, you know, our organization is very small and everybody, everybody wears multiple hats. So what I try to really instill is that, again, if it was up to you, what would you take? What's the next step? You know, and then people start thinking differently. It's really easy for somebody to give an opinion without the consequences, you know, like, oh, we should do this. Well, how are we going to do it? You know, if you, if you can't back, back up your, uh, your um, whatever, your words, then, you know, it means nothing. And so I think that's what effect, one of the things that takes to be effective um, is to instill kind of leadership in others and to always be able to see that, that um, view from the top. Right. Yeah, I think it's very important as well. And it's very interesting that you mentioned that um, it's a smaller team and everybody wears multiple hats. And regarding that, so how do you select these individuals who you can identify potential leadership um, value or skills in? And what tips do you have for others? Because as you know, we are all students and we may or may not have as much leadership experience as we would hope. So what are your advice in um, selecting your team regarding that yeah so I think there's multiple things um, you know one is that for me I took over an existing business and so I'm taking over people right and and I'm sure a lot of a lot of you if you go work for big companies you're not going to have the ability to um, potentially build a team from scratch and so for me it was like trying to figure out what is the right balance and initially, you know, I wanted to kind of honor what was already there. And I think maybe that's like the Asian part of me is, you know, honor your traditions and your, your um, superiors and your, you know, the elders and whatnot. Um, but eventually you really have to figure out like what works best for the business. And so um, I think it's been a hybrid, you know, and now I feel like I have a really good team. And in fact, when, when I finally got the right balance of team, of new people and old people and now we're working together like everything just kind of like um became so much better in terms of like how business was doing and also like the, the morale of the people and and you know i think choosing your team you know it's it's really i think character is so important you know is this person a good person are they going to they might not be the smartest person i'm not saying that my team is all smart like everybody's a genius on my team but, you know, um, sometimes you're not going to, they're not going to have all the, the best qualities and maybe they're not the, the smartest guy in the room, but do they have the right um, character? Do they have the right um, ability to work with others? Like that, that is so important to me because, you know, you could have the smartest guy and the cockiest person and the most arrogant person. And that person is not going to be able to lead the organization, not going to be able to work with others well. And it kind of just trickles outside of your organization. So I think um, having the right character. And then the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, you want to like, of course, fill your team with um, things that you don't have, right? So like, I don't like looking at certain like financials is not my strong point. Of course, I have a CFO for that. But like, if you're building a team and if you're good at marketing, then somebody else needs to figure out, you know, the technical stuff. And so try to like, don't build a team with people that are all the same qualities as you. You know, you got to try to balance that out. It's kind of like an RPG game, right? Like you, you've you got the hero and you've got the the mage and like all the different characters in the, and so how, how do you build that team? That's like a good balance. Wow. You know, I, I, we, I think everybody took a lot away from that as well, you know, and regarding that, you know, just to go into a bit more of the specifics and into the specifics, um, what would you, what would you say that your team is mostly comprised of regarding positions and how many people in per position, per position um, and the, you know, the titles that go along with it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, again, like if you're building a company or a team, you want to have the leader. You need to have the financial person. You need to have the marketing person, right? Um, somebody who's technical and somebody who's good at the legal stuff. And like for, for my company, I mean, those are like the five key kind of areas. And, you know, I, I can't do all of those, you know? So you rely on every single person to, to bring their best qualities. Right, right. 
Um, you know, just to give you a break um, from all of these heavy questions, I'd love to ask you so far, what has been the most surprising thing about being a CEO? Something totally unexpected, something you really don't like, anything. You know, it's funny because for me, I think when I took on this role, I never really thought about what it would really entail. Um, I, I, I kind of follow my intuitions a lot. And um, I, when I feel it, I, got, I kind of go for it. So I don't know that there's been surprises. Um, but you know what? Now that I think about it, I think one surprise was that, yeah, my dad ran his company. And I always thought, wow, well, I want to go work for him, you know? Um, before he retires. And now that I've kind of taken on that role, I'm like, wow, wow he's kind of winged it most of the time. You know, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of structure. And so, you know, every, everybody's different. Every leadership is different. Um, but that's probably what I, what I was surprised by the most was, yeah, he just kind of winged it. So, you know, that, that kind of attitude of, you know, winging it as well. And, you know, you mentioned that you're very, uh, you know, organized and it seems, you know, you built this structure around Tetris, just like the game, uh, if I might add, but, you know, what are some, have, have you had any troubles kind of distinguishing your role and your identity apart from your father's, you know, even as it's been, as you um, kind of taken the mantle over the years? Um, I think for me, I wouldn't, I don't think so. Um, maybe because I'm female too. Like, I, I feel like maybe if I was a male, like son, doing this maybe i would compete more with my dad but um my dad and i really got along you know my whole life and so we kind of understood each other and so i never felt like um yeah i never really felt that you know that i kind of didn't need to like compete against him but i could compliment him where he was you know not competent but you know he did teach me a lot and and i do feel like um, his ability to really see the world and like the opportunities and go for it. I mean, that's something that innately he, he has that I learned a lot from. I don't know if I answered that question. No, you did. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, you know, speaking on that, you know, you did mention that you tend to look for kind of invest in people, if I might say, you know, invest in people and relationships. And, you know, you've also been a co-founder of Blue Startups. So kind of, you know, referring to Blue Startups, could you share what, what, are the, what some steps or the background of Blue Startups is? Yeah, so Blue, Blue Startups is an, a tech accelerator. Um, we were founded in 2014 and um, we started it because around that time, you know, like accelerators were just coming on the scene. Um, companies or accelerators like Y Combinator and Techstars um, and they're, you know, coming out with huge startups, right? Billion dollar unicorns. And we thought um, that we should start something here. The reason why Tetris is in Hawaii is because this is where our, our family is, right? We have no business really being in Hawaii except for that. Um, and so we wanted kind of, we were the example and we wanted to be the example of other companies. Hey, you know what? There's no reason why you can't live and work you know, from your home, like where, where you want to be. And we're seeing that now with the pandemic, right? People can work virtually and guess what? Everybody's moving back to Hawaii or they're moving to Hawaii for a reason. And so um, we, wanted, we wanted to create this accelerator to really give a chance to entrepreneurs so that they didn't have to leave Hawaii to, to make their dreams come true. Um, and so today we've uh, invested in I think it's about it's a hundred companies, maybe ninety nine, maybe hundred companies, um, and half of the companies are from Hawaii, and we've had you know help from the state as well, and that was a big factor in in helping us get to where we are today. Um, but we were very proud that this last uh, this year in August we had our first um, public company uh, that went IPO, and you guys probably all have seen this company. Uh, do you know? Can you guess, Noah? There's a, a company that went public from Hawaii in August. Oh, yes, Tracy got it. Tracy beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Volta. So they were actually part of our first cohort. Um, and, and if you guys don't know Volta, they're the electric charging company. Um, you see their charging stations everywhere, Ala Moana, Salt Kakako, Kahala Mall. Um, so yeah, that's our accelerator. I'm sure you must be so proud of Volta. 
And, you know, when you invest in companies such as Volta, is there a spark or some kind of uh, some aspect that really draws you to these um, investments? Yeah, so we have an application process and we look at hundreds of companies. And at the end of the day, we only pick uh, anywhere from six to 10 companies each year to invest in and they go through a three month long program. And so it's, it's, um, it's a tedious process of picking those companies and then half those companies have to be from Hawaii, right? So if you're a Hawaii company, you do have a leg up in that, you know, there is a slot, right? Half the slots are for Hawaii companies. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, yes, your business idea is important. Um, you know, do you have a prototype? Do you have something that kind of shows that it, there is traction? Um, but I think the most important thing is really the entrepreneur. Does this person have what it takes to take this company to the next level? Companies will pivot, ideas will change, partners will disappear, but it's really up to the entrepreneur. Do you have what it takes? Right. And regarding that, what do you think are some avoidable mistakes that businesses? make that kind of lead to their downfall eventually yeah i mean so one of the first things that we teach at blue startups is uh learn your customer base right are you building a product that actually somebody needs or wants to use and so that market validation is number one and i think um you know back in the day i would say a lot of companies spent so much money building a product and then nobody wanted it and today in the startup world I feel like more companies are pivoting and they're, it's all about learning and you know putting your MVP out there, right? Your most viable product and, and testing, testing, pivot, pivot, pivot. Right. And you know, working with these businesses, do you work your fair share with many software developers and startups as well? I mean, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so basically most of the companies that we invest in are scalable technology companies. And the reason why that is, is because that you can scale right away, right? So within three months, how much growth can you have in your business? Um, like Volta was a, an exception, again, Hawaii company, and, and you know they're doing a physical product, which typically takes more time and research. Um, but the companies that we do like to invest in are companies that are heavy in tech because they can take that and go anywhere else. And same reason, right? They don't have to physically be in Hawaii or they could be in Hawaii and grow their business because at the end of the day, what they have is maybe intellectual property that they can protect over other things. And as you may know, ACM is joining us today and we, have, we do have quite a, fair, a large sorry, demographic of computer science um, students. So do you have any advice for um, software or game developers who are interested in building a company and, you know, kind of um, advice into where they should start and what their first step should be? And ACM is part of UH? Yes, it's yeah. part of the computer science major. So I want to say that uh, my father was a computer science major at UH. Um, he decided to go to night school um, and try to get his degree because he just wanted to learn about computers. And he never graduated because he never took his core credits. And uh, maybe like six years ago, he finally got his honor, honorary doctorate from UH. So he can say now he has a degree. Um, so what I'd like to say about that is that, you know, go after your passions. The fact that you're learning about computer science means you know what you want and passionate about. So that's awesome. Um, and then, what was your other question or oh, any advice, right? That you have for, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think sky's the limit. You know, all of you guys are so young and you're in the pocket of where you can still take risks and, you know, explore the world and, and go after your dreams. And, you know, as you get older, it's harder to do because you're putting everything on the line. Maybe you have families. Um, and so that's what I would say is that go after your dreams. Like if you are interested in computer science, great. You know, if you want to go and work for a big company, like find somebody that knows somebody and then get that connection and then go for it. Right. You know, you know, finding connections to, you know, work at that big company is really important. But I, I do know that a lot of our students do carry that entrepreneurial spirit. And do you have any advice on how an independent game company grow to become a game studio or you know large software licensing company such as yours 
any insider uh, tips? Yeah, I mean, the game business is, is tough, right? Like if you look at the mobile gaming uh, industry with something like 50,000 new apps that are launched every day. Um, and if you want to become a major, like a, a big game publisher, kind of really the odds are against you. But um, as you know, like I think today's world, right? Everything is, um, is software as a service. And so you launch a product and you, it's, it's not just ship and you're done with it, but you have to continue to develop, continue to come up with new things to keep your game alive. Um, so that takes a lot. So I would say like in the indie game world, probably some of the games that have kind of like broke through that barrier were games that doesn't require a lot of um, backward development. Um, you know, so they become, they're easy games and they were able to ship it and maybe they're doing in-game advertising, but the game itself is really compelling. And that when you have a compelling game, people will play, right? And so like, it's really that kind of word of mouth, like, like wildfire kind of spreading situation if you have a good game. Um, and so, yeah, make a good game, then hopefully that game will um, be successful. But I think it's tough. I think that indie games, um, you know, today, like where we are with Tetris is that we were the first puzzle game that kind of came up with this IP, it's, it's intellectual property. And so we were able to protect our IP so that nobody else could make Tetris. Um, and that's kind of our big differentiator. Um, but today, like if you look at, you know, any kind of like a match three type of Candy Crush type of game, there's millions out there. And so how do you differentiate those games with everybody else? I think that's really tough to do. Um, but at the end of the day, it com comes down to, can you make a compelling game and are people gonna play? Do they keep coming back to play? I mean, those things are really important. Are there any games out on the market right now that you're kind of buying and maybe perhaps wish that you kind of thought of the idea of um, anything that's trailblazing right now? Um, I don't know if I would say trailblazing, um, but what we're looking at for us is, um, there's a game called Bloku Doku. I don't know if anybody's played it. It's basically taking kind of Tetris-like pieces and you're, you know, it's like 10, 10, you're filling out the matrix. So, oh, we should have done that. You know, <laughs> this game had, um, it was sold for like close to, I don't even know if I can say this, but a lot of money. It was recently purchased by a company for like hundreds of millions of dollars. And again, this was an indie game and there's, I think lots of knockoffs, but check it out. Well, don't check it out, play Tetris. Okay, play Tetris, <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> um, I think another thing that a lot of students do worry about besides starting up a business is that, you know, a student with a technical background might struggle in kind of transitioning into a management role. So yeah. what skills do you think that devs might need to be successful in such a management or a CEO position? So I think that... I couldn't be technical if I wanted to. It's just not in my DNA, you know? And we see a lot of found, founders, entrepreneurs that are of technical background, but maybe they're not the right person to lead the team. And so I would say that, I don't know if you're, whether you're born with it, but certain people either have it or don't, and that's okay, right? Again, it's about finding others that can like, fill the part that you're not able to. And so I would say if you're a founder and maybe you're not the person that's gonna grow the business and go out and raise money, find that person because it all comes down to personality and all comes down to you know, what people see. Um, you know, Do you wanna hear this person pitch? Do you wanna give this person money? Do you really trust this person? And maybe as a technical person, you're not that person, but that's okay because you have other skills that are great. And so I think not everybody's meant to be a CEO and that's okay. And find a CEO that can help and build that team. Right. I think that's great advice. I know personally when I'm in a meeting with a supervisor or manager and they start throwing out, um, you know, credentials or, you know, certifications such as a PMP or whatever, whatever, I get really confused and it's kind of daunting at times. And I think, you know, a lot of our students today would love to know what sort of skills or things on the resume that you think would be important in kind of building their uh, professional future? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to experience, you know, 
I mean, sure, degree is important, but you know, at the end of the day, you could still be an art major and end up, you know, doing a business development role or something like that. So try to gain experience and relevant information, like have that relevant info that might be good for your job. Um, not everybody is, you know, college bound or maybe they have a degree. And I feel like I hear a lot of people like they might they have the street smarts, but maybe they don't have the right degree. Um, but again, I think it all comes down to experience and what what have you accomplished or what can you accomplish, you know, for your goal. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. That does. And moving on to my last kind of question, just tying back into uh, Kauai. Uh, you know, I know that you mentioned that Tetris is, in, you know, was based in Blue Star was based in Hawaii, you know, for that pure purpose of, you know, people on the island really wanting to pursue their career. And I know that there's a stigma that a lot of um, local people face, local students face. So with that, what do you think um, Hawaii needs in order to grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem? Everything. <laughs> we need everything. Um, you know, we need government support is huge. And I know that, the, I know that, you know, the state has been helpful. But if you look at some of these other places in the world that has, um, you know, become these tech hubs or what have you, it had a lot to do with the local support that they had, right? Like look at Singapore and look at, you know, Boulder, Colorado, like these became um, known for, you know, business innovation and hubs because it, it wasn't just the people living there, but it takes, it takes a village. Um, you know, I think Hawaii, we need funding, right? We need investors to invest in us. Um, I do feel though that, you know, we are getting there and people are really surprised that like, wow, there's actually like businesses coming out of Hawaii that are significant. You know, I think Volta's IPO is a testament to, it's a celebration for all of Hawaii. It's not just blue startup celebration, but like the fact that, wow, you know, we have an amazing company that was started out of Hawaii that's going after sustainability. And, you know, it was, you know, anyway, so it's showing, it's showing the world that Hawaii is a viable place for business. But I do think that now with, you know, people moving to Hawaii and like, the virtual thing happening everywhere. I mean, more and more and more so, you know, more investors are coming in. And um, I think what I'd like to add to that is, you know, you look at um, famous entrepreneurs that maybe made it out of Hawaii, um, you know, like Steve Case, who started AOL, or uh, Pierre Omdiar, right, who started eBay. Well, guess what? Like Pierre, he lives in Hawaii and his kids go to Punahou or his kids go to school here, Hanaho'oli, what have you, um, because Hawaii is the best place to raise your, ki raise your kids, right? And so um, it's just a testament, like there is reason why people come back to Hawaii. And so I think we need to be able to tap into those, um, you know, local people that are here, like come, come, Aina, come home and, and have them also help with the ecosystem. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's okay that everybody leaves Hawaii. You know, as long as they know that Hawaii is their home, I think people always come back or there's always a good story for Hawaii. Thank you for that. I think that was a great way to kind of add, you know, answer the question, but also kind of remind our students that it is okay to stay in Hawaii and grow their career in Hawaii. And with that, I would love to um, end this portion of the program with a lightning round. So it's uh -oh. basically the system is, yep, uh oh, is I'll ask you questions and it's, it's your job to answer them as fast as possible with little to no thought, um, maybe a little bit of thought, but not too much thought. Okay. So but when you're ready. I've been doing that this whole hour. I've been doing that this whole hour. So. Oh, yeah. But those are the, those are the heavy and boring questions. They should be a little, little right. bit more fun. Okay. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, one, two, three. Who is your favorite Disney character? Oh, Ariel. Ariel, okay. What is your highest score on Tetris? My highest score on Tetris higher than yours. Oh, okay. Favorite video game besides Tetris? <laughs> Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing, okay. And a book that you would recommend? Oh my goodness. Look at a blink. Anything from Malcolm Gladwell. I, I will try to read that in the future. Um, favorite TV show right now? Favorite TV show right now. What am I watching? Holy crap. 
there's too many shows. I don't know. My favorite show that is Shit's Creek. It's not something I'm watching, but it's definitely Shit's Creek. If you haven't watched it, watch past three season three. Watch it till the end. That's actually one of my favorite shows. And my next question kind of relates to that. So it would be business role models in TV or media. And as you know, um, Rose, Rose is um, David Rose. No, his father was, you know, is another business role model in TV. There's Michael Scott from The Office, Jack Donaghy from 30 Rock. Do you have any business um, role models in, the, in TV? On TV, like a fake person? A fake person. Oh, um, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of one, but a funny person just came to my mind was um, Veep, who, the woman who played Veep. What's her name? This is not a role model, but it, she just cracks me up in how she deals with things. It's a comedy and she's not a role model, but that's, I think, the kind of the point. <laughs> that's it. That's a, yeah, yeah, Julia. Oh, yeah. That's probably not a role model. Uh, I don't know. That's that's kind of a funny question because I probably don't watch shows where I feel like, like I'm watching Succession. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's an HBO show. And I don't, I don't think anybody's a role model in that show, but they're <laughs> business tycoons. Okay. And now we will open it up for questions from the audience. Um, just a reminder for the audience, if you have any questions, please do type them um, using the chat function and turn on your video um, if you do wish to do so. Noah, well, we had a question from Pedro earlier on. Okay. Uh, so Pedro asks, can you provide more details or breakdown on how a licensing deal works in terms of figuring out the margins and licensing structures? Yeah, um, so it's, there's a kind of a standard um, percentage. So uh, going back to like licensing, what does that mean? And what's my role? What's our role in this whole industry? Is that like we're, we're the agents of the brand. Right. So Tetris. So imagine Tetris is like the athlete. I don't know. Give me give me a famous athlete. Odell. Who? Odell. OK, whoever, the, whoever that is. LeBron, LeBron James. LeBron James. Clearly, I don't do sports. OK, so LeBron James has an agent. Right. And the agent goes out and looks for uh, different deals like uh, advertising deals or merchandising deals. And so we're the agent for the brand. And so depending on what the um, product is, so if we're doing a merchandising deal, there's sort of like a, a, a standardized uh, percentage of how much you would take per product. You know, so it could be in merchandising, it could be anywhere from like five to 15%. So if somebody is making a Tetris keychain, then maybe we're taking 10% of, their, of the profit um, versus video games. You know, it could be anywhere from 10 to 25%, you know, or somewhere, somewhere in that. And so it just depends, but you know, we're not we're not inventing those numbers. It's sort of that industry standard. And the sun's setting in my face. Other, other uh, question. Question, if you don't mind, the sun setting in my face. Um, also, sorry for being late. Thank you for letting me into the uh, presentation. So I'm curious if you have um, one personal habit that you've developed over the years that has helped you professionally, um, regardless of what it is. If you have one that comes to mind, I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Well, let me, do you have one? I don't know who's asking the question. Do you have one that you wanna share? Oh shoot, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, so I was wondering if you have a personal habit that you've developed oh, over the years that's helped you in your profession. Yeah, I heard your like, question and I was asking if you had one, a habit. I don't know if it's a habit, well, I, I'll tell you. Um, I think one of the things is like networking is really important. And so um, one tip for networking is always go straight to the bar. If you guys are old enough to drink, of course. Um, but you always have a drink, then you don't feel like you're alone. You know, you get a drink and then you can network with everyone else. But I straight go to the, no matter what, if I walk into a ballroom, I go straight to the bar, grab a drink, then I'm home. I don't know if that's necessarily a habit, but. 
Rena's laughing. Thank you. I have story of my life, technical difficulties over here. So I missed the first part, but I think you're asking me if I have a professional habit and uh, I try to follow the five second rule, which is if I think about doing something, I try to do it within the next five seconds because otherwise statistically my chances of doing it will decrease. But I appreciate, I think yours is a little more fun. <laughs> That's a really, that's a good, really good habit. And, and, you know, it's really hard to do. I, I think right now I have got like 20 um, websites open, you know, cause I don't want to lose it. And then once I jot it down, then it's like, forget about it. Yeah. Okay. I think Lucy Rock had a question. Lucy, did you want to ask? Um, yeah, I actually kind of had two questions for you. Um, the first one that I wanted to ask was, um, what is the best professional advice you've received from like a mentor? Um, and the second one was, um, as a female in the tech business, <laughs> what has been the most like significant barrier in your career, I guess, that you faced? Yeah, um, I would think that, you know, the advice um, that I receive is, you know, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, um, you know, if you can. Um, I think always reaching out to mentors or finding mentors that you can talk to, um, you know, ask them to go to lunch. People love talking about themselves, right? So like, if you have, if you know somebody that is, you know, that are older than you and that have the experience, like, you know, go out, go out to lunch with them and like hear their life story, because it's really amazing, you know, how much, uh, how many things that people have overcome and like had to get, get through to become who they are today, you know? And so that would be an advice that I have. Um, being a female, anything, um, you know, has always been a challenge, I think, especially in the tech and business world, because, you know, oh, you're just a girl. And so I think I kind of grew up with like a chip on my shoulder, um, always trying to prove myself or look more professional. Um, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, if you are confident and know what you're doing, people see that and they respect that. And so it's always um, kind of coming, coming at them with like a surprise, like, oh, I didn't actually think that you were, you know, able to do this or you were this kind of person. Like people just always assume you're female and certain things so you got to just prove them wrong I don't know if that answered your question Lucy but it did. thank you so much I appreciate it <laughs> like we all somebody said this in a meeting today we all have a wonder woman inside we just some people don't know that there is a wonder woman and so you got to just like talk to your inner inner self the difference I don't know if it's a difference but what women have and a lot of all of us have is intuition, right? Your gut feeling. And I think listening to that is really important because when you waver from that, then you start thinking just in your head and that's not necessarily always the right answer, you know? And so I think always listen to your instinct, instincts because it's telling you something for a reason. But you have to be grounded at the same time. <laughs> okay, you know, thank right. you. <laughs> Jacob, you have a question? Oh, um, not, not necessarily, but I can think of one on the spot. So I recognize that you mentioned that Tetris was venturing um, into, I guess, maybe new territory and kind of turning into a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. And you specifically mentioned um, some avenues such as uh, movies. So I, I was a little curious on um, the, I guess the platform um, it would be on, and you know how you how you're basically turning it into um, a media property or like making it part of your business. Yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you asked that question because I I'm so excited about the movie. Um, so the movie actually is a biopic. It's a story of how Tetris came. It's basically a story of how my father founded Tetris 
and took it out of the Soviet Union and convinced Nintendo to put it on the Game Boy and it became this worldwide phenomenon. And um, the story is really this, my father's origin from Holland, but he grew up in the States. And so, you know, American entrepreneur befriends this Russian programmer. And he, against all odds, was trying to get the license um, from the Soviet government. So imagine today, if you were to go to a communist country, imagine if you're going to North Korea, because we, you knew that there was a game that somebody had you know, created out of, this, of North Korea. Like my dad went to the Soviet Union in the 80s on a tourist visa and like found this ministry of games and said, hey guys, give me this game. So long story, but um, he was this you know, small entrepreneur out of Japan with not a lot of money up against this uh, media conglomerate company from the UK. And the Soviets, um, they, they chose my dad because he formed this relationship with Alexei Pajitnov, the creator of the game, and they trusted him. He gave him an honest deal versus the other guy was trying to kind of bully him around. And so that whole story is around that. Um, and, and so anyway, it's going to be on Apple Plus. Um, the movie was shot during the height of the pandemic. So we weren't able to go see the, the, the shooting of it. But my father is being played by Taron Edgerton, who is the guy who played Rocket Man, Elton John, and he played, oh gosh, I always forget the other one. Anyway, do, do you guys know? He was like a superhero with like the tie and the, and the glasses. Anyway, I should know this. Anyhow, Kingsman, yes, thank you. He, he's the main guy from Kingsman. So he's playing uh, my father and yeah, it'll be coming out next year on Apple Plus. And I'm in the movie as a, a, ch a child who only speaks Japanese. Wow, oh, awesome story. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that movie. I picked on you, Jacob, because you were one of the few ones that had your camera on the whole time. Oh, right. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, dedicating part of your day to kind of sharing your knowledge with all of us. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Thank you, students, so much for your uh, wonderful questions. Um, I can take one last question if there is not. Anybody have any last burning questions? Okay, so with that, um, thank you again so much. There is one question from Jessica. Jessica, did you wanna ask your question? There's two questions. Oh, sure. Um, I just wanted to know if you guys uh, still keep in touch with Alexi. Of course, yes. So Alexi and Hank are partners. Um, they um so in the initially when alexi created the game because he was a citizen of the soviet union he had no rights no no ownership um and in the mid 90s uh, my father bought the ip from the russians so it was like owned half and half and when that happened for the first time alexi could become owner of his own creation and so my dad and alexi are still partners to this day. They do everything together. Um, they're kind of like as different as you can get. You know, I kind of talked about my dad being this kind of like free spirited, uh, crazy entrepreneur guy. And Alexi is a very, very Russian and very just complete opposites, but it's such a, an amazing partnership to watch. And so, yes. And we don't have, internships but we you know what we probably should we we haven't considered internships but if you're interested yeah please talk to me email me okay so with that uh we'd love to thank you my thank you so much for your time today and you know just answering our questions even if some of them were heavy and some of them were um you know two to three questions jammed into one thank you so much for your time before you go we would love to take a group photo with